Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 274 for Monday, October 5th, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire, because I'm not going anywhere. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Because you're not going anywhere right now either, my friend. Not going anywhere. Um, so is it starting to get cold and, you know, the hints of things starting to shut down for the winter process are happening with you? Um, hints. Yes. It's starting to get cold. Like the, you know, we'll have days in the seventies, maybe high sixties, but then at night it's in the forties or fifties, you know? So it, like there's a, there's a definite drop off in the evening, yeah. you know, the, 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 for sure. But um, yeah, they, they, I mean, we know that things will be shutting down uh, outdoor things will be shutting down for the winter. We aren't seeing that yet. Like people are hanging on, <laughs> you know, like I just got a call for a, a gig with Amanda on Sunday afternoon, you know, this coming Sunday afternoon. So, uh, so we're having the testing conversation as, as of course, you know, outdoor gig, obviously nice. Sunday afternoon. Yeah. 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 So, y- you know, like, yeah, though, but, but, it's like, I was pleasantly surprised to get that call. It's like, Oh, right. We, we might be able to get another one of these in, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So I'm actually driving up to um, do my first, it's, I, I guess you'd say it's a rehearsal, but it's kind of more of a get together with James my, my house rocker, but yeah. Yeah. just the rhythm section. We haven't solved the horns mm. and the projecting of horn, you know, stuff yet. Yeah. So it's just the five of us in the rhythm section. And what we've agreed to since it's an indoor rehearsal is masks. We're pretty close to six feet distance all the time. We're going to do 20 to 30 minute chunks and then open the garage door and, you know, air some things out and then go back to work. So we're going to do that. You know, that that's our solution to this. Is everybody getting tested before you go in the, in the room together? No, No, because testing is not guaranteed to be, turned around that fast and not, and also not free. And so the testing part of it, we can't, you know, we, we can't do that. So we had a discussion, like, is there any exposures, you know, or interactions and that you guys have had in the last couple, in the last couple of days that, you know, you think you want to give everybody, you want to tell everybody and everybody can make a decision whether that's too much for them. Yeah. So Simon, you know, shared, I've had a gig, and it was outdoor and, you know, I'm don't let anybody get six feet within me. So nobody came other than that. I've been with my family and, you know, let just, yeah. you know, basically self-contact tracing. The, the awkwardly thing. transparent conversation is, is what yeah. I call it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we, we are everything but the testing. Yeah. And, um, I, 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 I don't forget. I am, I am keenly aware of how fortunate we are here in new England with, with our testing right now. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Yeah. Hopefully that can become a thing that's much easier nationwide. I think it will be. I think, you know, it's, it's being worked on by. Yeah. yeah. It's insanity. That's not, it's. You yeah. Know, yeah. All the, be, be, <laughs> we don't, we need to do that show again. We've done sure. that show. We last, have, we've done it last. time and again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But um, so, yeah. So this is our first choice. And actually the reason I bring this up is. I'm still not crystal clear with all my guys because it's done over Slack. And so you're not looking someone in the eye yeah. and where everybody is. W- the conversation we started was, can we agree to a writer that everybody feels comfortable with addresses all the points uh, of what you need to feel safe doing a gig, right? Uh, you know, what's yeah. the security like around the back of the stage, you know, is what, what's our load in situation specifically, you know, how many hands, you know, are you going to have around the stage, how much distance to an audience, all this type of stuff. We're not, you know, we've tried to have the conversation. My interpretation is some guys don't know what they don't know. And so they don't want to say anything. And so they're just uncomfortable. I, so can I, I offer know. a, can I offer some, some perspective on this? Yeah. Finish your, th- if you want to finish your thought, but I, I, Go ahead. Yeah. Well, my, my thought is I also, I, I worry a little bit that we're going to be like nine to two or 10 to one of guys on the same page. And some part of me says, no, you know, I guess the, the, the one or two, I guess you say they're subbed 
nobody should get fired, right, for not mm -hmm. being on the same page about this. So I guess it's technically a sub situation for X amount of time. Um, but we'll, you know, what it's like when guys say, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to take those gigs because I'm sick, or I don't want to get sick," and and then they see the band moving on. These are those, those fragile interpersonal things that you manage. Like, are they going to feel like the band is leaving them behind and then they're going to get bitter and you know, that's, you know, it's not going to be for them anymore. So, you know, I, I would like to be able to manage through that eventuality. You know, I, I think that that might be where we are is I might have one or two guys who are still like, absolutely not. It's not right. It's not the time yet. Yeah. And most of the other guys are going to say, well, given these safety precautions, it is the time. And I, you know, I don't want to lose a guy, you know, over him not wanting to get sick. That I don't think that's right. Um, but, you know, when does it become a, you know, it's safe enough the way that we've outlined it, you know, or, you know, we got to figure out, are we a band still? So Yeah. Yeah. So I like the first few gigs that I did, I was definitely in the. I don't know what I will agree to because I haven't been there yet to know what mm -hmm. I need to agree to. Right. So it, we all uh, agreed to leave it as a, a malleable thing. And we all agreed that every one of us has veto power on the gig to say like, okay, this just got unsafe. Like we, we're out and, and the band would back it, you know, and we, and that's kind of where we, where we were as we stepped into these, into these gigs like okay and it, and this was true with monkey fist it was true with bitter pill it was true with the theater stuff that i was doing like everybody we all had permission to not know what we needed because this is our first pandemic and and i and that really helped me no i mean it didn't mean that we didn't go through the list and have like okay would we you know the things that we could think about we did and and we sort of made our list like you said the writer or whatever you want to call it but, but mm -hmm. then it was like, you know, line 10 was in the, kind of like a job description, you know, and all of the duties is assigned by management or whatever, you know, it was like this, this blanket thing of, and anything else that might feel uncomfortable in the moment will address. And, and even at the first gig, we had uh, the, the first gig we did at the football field with monkey fist, we had, you know, we thought we had it all sorted out, but we hadn't been there yet. And now suddenly the you know, kind of the owner of the property starts coming up on stage and he wasn't wearing a mask and not during the gig, but while we were loading in and John to his credit, like stepped right in. He's like, Hey man, uh, like I know we didn't talk about this. We should have, you know, the stage is socially distanced and masked, uh, except for when we're performing and we'd prefer to have the, the state, the only people be on stage be us. And that's a weird thing to say to somebody that owns the stage you're standing on, you know, but, yeah. but, but, it, you know, we dealt with it in the moment. And, and I think we were all at that point, if it wasn't going to work out, it was like, okay, well, please just stand over there while we pack our stuff into our cars and we'll go home. You know, like if it didn't, we, he didn't, we didn't have to mention or threaten or, you know, it didn't, it didn't get there, but, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you kind of need to have that, that rip cord. I, I needed, I don't know about you. I needed to have that rip cord going into that. Like, yeah, yeah, if this doesn't feel right, I need to know that I can walk away. And yes, it is influencing and impacting, you know, many people's lives, not just the other 10 people in the band or the other two or the other five or however big it is. But, um, you know, we'll talk about it later kind of thing. And, and having that and knowing that I had that allowed for some, kind of on the fly, you know, uh, ad adaptations uh, like, okay, wait, this isn't safe, but we can tweak this and make it safe. And now we know to put this next thing on the list for the next gig, you know, and that sort of thing. So perhaps that's one way to approach it with your guys to say, okay, look, given everything, you know, is this rider list enough knowing that the things we don't know will be addressed in the moment. And some, some of those things might be, might mean that we decide to walk. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I don't know. But like, it's just an idea. Mm -hmm. We have we have so, a mailbag this week, Paul. But go ahead. Sorry. We, well, we've been making that plea for a couple of weeks, like asking people and, and listeners have been awesome. And we've gotten a lot of nice notes lately. And the funny thing I, I see about these notes, like we've always gotten the, like, hey, enjoy the show. Keep doing what you're doing type stuff. But we actually have several listeners who write us little long, detailed feedback oriented, you know, sharing their experiences, notes. 
And it's really interesting that people, um, uh, they want us to know and they want us to share what's going on, you know, in their corner of the world with their band. So yeah, this week we have a couple of really, really cool, um, uh, mailbag things to share with people. Yeah. I'm going to start with Gord. Uh, Gord wrote in and, uh, I, um, you know, I should have asked Gord if I could share his band name, so I'm not going to, but in, in the future, if you include your band name in an email, we'll share it and we'll link to it too. So Gord, if you're hearing this and you want us to link to it, just tell us, we'll, we'll bring it back in the next episode. Um, but Gord says, uh, my band is continuing to rehearse during the pandemic as we are a trio and we have enough space to physically distance. All right. Well, well, lucky you, Gordon. Uh, he says <laughs> we are. T- well, I mean, that alone, that alone is like probably worthy of discussion. I think it's great. Like, you know, that, that they're able to do it and very fortunate. He says we are taking the opportunity to learn new material. Normally, we would add a few tunes to the set and then gauge audience feedback. After a few shows, we then decide where a new song should be in the set in the evening, first, second, third set, or whether it gets dropped altogether. However, due to the pandemic, we have added approximately 20 new tunes in a complete vacuum with no audience feedback whatsoever. Whenever our first show back happens, it has the potential to be amazing or something awful. So this is this is great. Again, very fortunate that you're able to even do this. But you're smart that you're taking this opportunity you have, and and in moving your band forward. Now, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but the kind of the first one that comes to mind, Paul, because we taught we say it all the time, is always be performing. You know, are you informing your fan base of any of this? Are you you know videotaping snippets of rehearsal? Uh, you know, sharing the the names of the new songs you've learned, or maybe even have a contest for your listeners, like share an instrumental section of the tune that you like video quick or whatever, put that on Facebook and, and or, you know, YouTube or wherever and say, hey, what song do you think we, we've added to the set? And, you know, keep the engagement happening with the people that are following you so that A, they've got something to be entertained by when they can't be in the room being entertained by you and B, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're engaging people and, and, and building a little bit of, I don't know. So that, that was just one thought that came to mind. And, and that was not that. a huge surprise when people come and see you. Yes. I, you've said something really interesting. I think it's a whole series of shows we can do, but musicians are getting smarter and because the tools are getting more accessible. So mm. I'm thinking about some of my friends here who, when the pandemic started, they did a couple of streaming things purely goodwill just to keep people entertained and keep themselves sane, which turned into weekly commitments every Saturday at six o'clock, which turned into getting their chops with the tools to make a professional looking stream happen, which turned into conversations I would never have had with them before. Like, you know, here are my metrics from my last stream, the number of viewers I had, how long they were on, to getting some concept that this is a way to aggregate an audience. And, you know, then when I have an audience, what do I want to do with them? And when, and it always is dot, 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 you know, when things open up. So there's this, there's this connection that musicians are making now about things that you can do now that are business marketing type things that tie into your overall strategy of having a conversation with your audience. And, and I think um, what you're saying is that if you, if you understand that that's the game you're playing now, the concept of experimenting with new material and, and, um, and talking to your audience about it and setting expectations with your audience, uh, that's an interesting conversation to have. So you're actually including them in your band's growth. You're actually yeah. including them. You know, it's like, a, you know, I have a one friend who listens to us and who's not a musician. I'm like, why is this of interest to you? He goes, Oh man, you know, cause I love music and this is like an inside baseball thing. It's a, it's yeah. a peek under the kimono of, you know, what you guys do to do the thing that I enjoy so much. And that type of engagement is really interesting. Some people just want to hear some notes coming over their speakers. Some people want to see you. Some people want to know you. And I would, I would, I would offer that, you know, many people, if you have an audience who's this interested in hesitating what you play, they probably have more than a passing interest in knowing about you. And so finding the appropriate way for your band, I'll leave it at that, yeah. um, to kind of communicate your band's journey is a great story and a way to in, engage people and get them on, on your train. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think, I think this is, yeah, there's opportunities here. And, and fun ones too, like the, the, like 
I, I wish Fling were getting together every week and we could do something like this. Like, that would be great. But but we are doing this, like, with Bitter Pill. Like, we were doing the pandemic shows that we, we you know, when we yeah. had the album out. And we've got some other stuff that were going on. But there's, like, it, we are... One thing that, that, you know, I didn't even think about it until now, but one thing that's happening is we are letting the, the we have a, a you know, a group, a private group that the, the band uses to communicate about, you know, things. And, and that's not open to people outside of the band, right? Yeah. But, but there have been more and more conversations that have just happened on sort of random Facebook threads where the entire band, sometimes it's not even a band member's post. It's like a fan's post or a friend of one of the band members that sort of everybody else knows it's one of their posts. And then, you know, the subset of the comments will devolve into like band discussion happening in public. Yeah. And, and I did, and it, it felt natural to us, you know, B Billy comes from the theater world. And so, and I, I do this kind of stuff. I mean, I guess I'm in the theater world, but I'm not an actor, you, you know, but, but I do this kind of stuff. So I'm used to having parts of my life just be public and, and, you know, somewhat on display. And, and it didn't even dawn on me until now that it's like, wait a minute, like we're keeping our fans engaged by, by doing that, by having those conversations. Now, obviously if there's a disagreement or whatever, you got to be careful how you let that play out in, you know, a public forum. It can be funny or it can be weird. Right. And so, you know, be, read the room, delete a comment after you post it. If you feel like it, maybe it, it doesn't fit, you know, those sorts of things. But um, but by the, by and large, like, yeah, there's, there's opportunities here to keep the, the dynamic going. I mean, if people are used to seeing your band communicate with each other on stage, well, think about all the places that you are on stage together virtually right now. Yeah. And, and yeah. So yeah. yeah. Interesting. So my pal Simon, who is one of those guys who has turned his, he actually, he actually streams several times a week. Yeah. And he is approaches, you know, kind of Mo Betta, right. You know, like. <laughs> You know, I may not get a hundred people every time, but you know, if I get 20 people three times a week, that's, that's interesting as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's actually started to, as he's taken a few uh, uh, public gigs. So going to plan at a restaurant, I think he has two restaurants that he plays. And I think he's going to play a winery. He's now streaming those things and, you know, people putting the math together that, all right, well, this medium is now, you know, the line between live and, streamed is blurring a little bit. Uh, and I don't actually, as that comes out of my mouth, I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. Right. I, and that's a really interesting conversation to have. What we do as musicians live in terms of harnessing the energy in a room is, is a, you have to understand how to translate that to a stream. I'm not saying yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely different skill. I'm just simply saying they're, they're, they're different things that you have to understand how they cross over. But, you know, the concept that, well, you know, yeah, I'm a local, you know, cover artist, but why, why do I spend my time only thinking about, you know, local draws and, you know, there's monetization and there's audiences to, to develop. Why that's why when I say musicians are getting smarter, this has been imposed upon us. You know, we, we need to do stuff. My guy, my uh, sax player, Mike Mendoza, I think he has done the best job with streaming. And, and it's really been interesting me to watch him. He does every Sunday at five o'clock. He's a saxophone player. So he, he basically plays him uh, to uh, tracks, basically. So, okay. you know, he, yeah. You know, right. Yeah. And then he, you know, plays the melodies and takes a solo and that type of thing. And every week he has advanced his art. Um, he, how he address, talks to his audience, you know, in between songs. It's almost like a DJ, right? He kind of introduces the song. He says hello to people that are <laughs> that are listening in. It's and it's actually quite entertaining and, and entertaining and it's in, engaging, and um, it is creating a, a vibe. And then he plays, and he's a great player. So you know the music part is always good. I've watched how his his production values have gone up every single week. You know, I, he invested in some good sound gear. You know, he's mixed excellently. The sound is pristine, and the the newest thing is he is starting to migrate because of some of the conversations like what we've had to YouTube from Facebook, uh, yeah, you know, for copyright things and for, um, you know, streaming quality things. Uh, so he's, he's going through the process of trying to get his, his hard earned Facebook audience over to YouTube for the streams. And, um, so he's, he like, I, I'm going to give you, uh, his, uh, for the show notes. It'd be cool if people could check it out. His, his, uh, like, 
there's a walk-in graphic now. There's a graphic before he starts playing that that reminds people to click like and you know give him a thumbs up. I mean, he is just and he's he has learned all this stuff over the course of having to get to this stuff. And it looks great and it sounds great. And he's done a really super job. And so he's like that evolving musician who's like, now, well, I'm doing all this stuff. And yeah, it's great to play for my friends and family, but you know, if someone in, in Chile, you know, wants to hear good sax music, this is a real good use of your time. Yeah. I got, and I got now, you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it's interesting, but the concept that musicians are getting smarter as we go along and thinking about audiences and monetizing to their audience and, and uh, presenting to their audience in different ways and how it connects to what things will look like when things open back up. I think those are really fascinating things to watch there. You know, it's part technology, part sociology, part musician chops. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of disciplines that are, that are going up the flagpole at once. Yeah. I, and I, I think you, for those of you that are struggling with this or wanting to improve your craft, whether you're struggling or not, it doesn't really matter. But you know, your comment about thinking about this, like you're a radio DJ really is a great way and a great place to look to get some in some inspiration because those people, you know, that profession, you may not have thought about this before. Maybe you have, but they're people sitting alone in a room for hours entertaining, you know, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, but they are sitting alone in a room. And yep. so there's that conversation that they're having with you that you are not a part of in the way that you would be if you were in the room to, together. You are still a part of it. They know you're a part of it. You know you're a part of it. But taking some of those, you know, listen to your favorite DJs. I'm sure there's like DJ school lessons on, you know, YouTube or wherever, where, you you know, you've got some people that'll just share their tricks. Those might be some good tricks to learn. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. So your, 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 your toolkit gets larger. Yeah. And, but the, but the return on the investment for learning those tools is actually pretty cool. Yeah. You want to take us to Eric, man? I do want to take us to Eric. So, uh, see Eric, uh, sent up a note that said, Hey guys, long time listener, first time emailer, love the podcast and all the knowledge I've been able to get from you guys. Thanks, Eric. Um, I wanted to drop a note regarding the discussion on set lists in the last newest episode, which has been the last episode. First, a brief bit of background. I have been in my current band for exactly one year. The band has been together with some bit of turnover for close to 15 years. A little over a year ago, one of their leaders, a vocalist and lead guitar player, had a vacation in Ireland scheduled, so they asked me to fill in for two dates he would be missing. A week before his vacation, he unexpectedly passed away. I filled in and never left. It's a great group of guys, and we all get along very well, which is the most important thing for all of us. One thing that attracted me to the group musically was that they, we, have hardly any of the standard cover band songs in the set list. We play predominantly country and classic rock. The leader of the band always says he wants to do things people can't hear all the time. To be honest, I was skeptical in the beginning. For example, we kick off every show with Joy to the World by Three Dog Night. Not something I've heard in another band absolutely wow. <laughs> in this time do. Yeah. I can't even imagine a band where I am trying to, trying to open a show with that right now. Uh, the set bounces around the decades and genres hitting songs like country boy can survive and feel so right to waiting for the bus. Jesus just left Chicago and hotel California. What surprised me was when we would hit something obscure was the looks on the faces in the crowd, like the look of flipping across the dial and hitting something familiar, but uncommon. Someone is always singing along with every song. So, Eric, I, I love this email and I love the story. My first thought on this is this goes back to something you and I have been saying for a long time. And that's about, um, is your band on the same page? I think one of the foundational things to make that work, what Eric is describing is that everybody has to love the challenge of that journey of going over with uncommon material. Yep. I've, I've played with guys who are like, no, you know, we're here to make people dance, give them the stuff they want, give them the familiar and then we'll work. And uh, that guy or those guys are not on that same page. And what that does to, to pull away from the joint energy bands are at their best when everybody is pointed in the same direction and fighting for the same cause. Right. When everybody is, is, you know, all in always performing all in on delivering the vibe. 
And, you know, whether that's a, a, a contrived thing or a natural thing, because people just love it so much, you know, you, you know, like, like if I was in a band like that and we're like, yes, we're going to be the uncommon band. I'm bought into that mission and I'm just going to get a kick out of listening to everybody trying to make this alive. If you're sitting there second guessing that it's not the right strategy for a band, I think it'll, it'll tear it at the seams. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that you're, so there's so much to unpack here. I, I, I like where you've taken this because this would not work if everybody wasn't on that page. And it doesn't mean that, that that's the only page, but that is the only page for that band to be on, right. In order for it to do what it does. Otherwise, it, you know, you bands wind up take, taking their challenge level down to the, the lowest common denominator. Yes, absolutely. Right. And so if you have one member of the band who is vocally against that type of challenge, or quite frankly, any type of challenge, you as a band will have a much harder time succeeding. I'm not going to say you're not going to succeed at the challenge, but it's going to be a lot harder if you've got somebody. Well, there's also degrees of, of yeah. pushback, right? There's guys who are like, well, yeah. I'll do it. But, you know, philosophically, I don't think it's the best thing versus guys who are like, I absolutely think this is wrong for us. Right. I mean, there's, there's, there's shades of gray in that in uh, assessing that. Totally. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, having everybody on the same page. And, and I think that. That's key because I was thinking about this. We've all had those tunes or, well, I've certainly had those tunes. And I think, I think, you know, by and large in our various experiences of being in different bands, you know, we've all kind of had that, that song that somebody else brought to the band. You scratched your head at it. Like, um, okay. Like, you know, uh, we got to let this go. We got to let this one try. We got to let them try it out. That's fine. You know, let's see what happens. We'll put it in a spot in the set where, you know, it can do minimal harm. And, and let's see what happens. And then suddenly it's like, you know, the hit of the night. And, and, and that's a great thing, right? Because you're like, oh, right. Like you said, if everybody's on the same page, if everybody delivers the song with conviction, some of those songs, the right ones for that particular group of musicians who is performing it can go over amazingly well, even if they're not the most well-known songs. Right. But, but mm -hmm. even, even like what he said, like three or uh, yeah, the three dog night thing, the joy to the world, which I think is a cover, right. I, I don't even think they, they were like the best cover band in the world. Weren't they? I don't think they wrote any of their own material, but anyway, I think that, you're right. That, but that's a, that's just rock trivia. Um, but you know, that tune, like, you start the stage and everybody hits whomp, Jeremiah, whomp, like that people are in, right? Like that's going to get attention. And, and, and if you deliver it well, it's going to work. But yeah. if you don't deliver it well, it's going to be like, wah, 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 you know, but, Whereas, and again, there's shades of gray in there. There's, totally. there's like deliver If four out of five guys deliver it well, it'll probably go over, mm -hmm. but it's not what it could be. If five out of five guys, you know, are, yeah, are, are all, all in, all right? in with their hearts. That's right. Yeah. And you know it too, when you're watching a band, if everybody's you in. Do. Yep. And I've even seen like pro bands where, you know, bands that we all know about where you can tell like one guy's not too sure if this is a good idea. You know, it's like, Oh, that's not such a good thing. Like you can't, but you also can't you telegraph that. <laughs> You can't tell, but I've actually seen the flip side of that where a, a weird song selection is going over and you can tell the guy who brought it in the band should have looked to the guy who was, who was the, <laughs> right. And, yep. and, you know, told you, you know, so. kind of get that, yeah, I told you so. Exactly. I I've played with a guy who um, does that type of stuff. He kind of brings challenging out there material and he is very good at single-mindedly knowing he has to sell the song to the audience and sell the song in the band. And like, I'm not good at that. Like if I start feeling that energy pull apart, you know, I worry, I empathize too much that yep. uh, the band's not into this. I'm, I'm the and same it way. From, <laughs> it takes away from my performance, but I know guys who like single-minded, like I am going to ram this down everybody's throat and, you know, I'm going to prove myself right. And that's a, you know, I think there's a skill in there so long as he's willing to admit if it doesn't go over. It doesn't you know, go, well, that's the key to this, right? It is because I, I've, I've been in bands with, with, you know, that guy that brings in the weird songs or the songs that you think are weird. Right. And then it's like, OK, well, let, let's try it. And then, you know, like I said, it, it goes over really well. You get a couple of those and then you have to be careful because at that point, you know, you're like, OK, well, th we've got a track record. The right song with this band is good, but you've got to you've got to be 
everybody needs to know that every song needs to go through the the approval process, if you will, right? The vetting process. And the first part of vetting it is, you know, selecting the tune and having everybody say, yes, I think our band would be good at performing that song. And then step two, as I'm kind of cogitating this out, would be rehearsing the tune, right? And and seeing if you can convince yourselves that that it's working. And that might take yeah. some salesmanship from somebody in the band. Like, that's okay. Like, no, guys, like, let's not give up. I think if we try it again and we make this tweak, trust me on this, you know, go with me. Like, you got to have some level of that. And then once you get it kind of past that step, then, you know, step three is take it out on the road, road test it. Right. right. And, and, but at any point, even the person who is, you know, the, presumably the person that brought it in is the one emotionally committed to keeping the tune there. Although it's better if that starts to become infectious and spreads throughout the band, like, oh, we can make this work, you know. But even if that's the case, even if the entire band wants it to work, you, you have to be really careful to look at it objectively. And if you trot it out two or three times and it, you know, it's if your band's a dance band and that tune wipes the dance floor clean, then you got to know that you, you can pull it and you need to pull it from the set. Like and I've seen it happen where somebody gets a somebody in the band gets a track record for pulling things together. And then suddenly it's like, well, they're not putting as much thought into this. It's just like, oh, yeah, you, you know, oh, I'm just going to pull in some of my favorite songs and then get a little pissy when those songs don't work and the rest of the band doesn't want to put them on the set list anymore. It's like, wait, we all, what, are, like you said, are we all on the same page? Let's define what that page is. And now let's compare the results of this one song to that page. Does it fit? You know? So we've had these conversations about, I, I can't even picture democracy bands because they're never they're never democracies it's they're sure. really more functions of the guy who speaks up the most or the yeah. or the two or three people who speak up the most and this would be you know a really good example like when a and go you know, just make this a, a gig gab law like bands are most successful when everybody is on the same page and pointed into the right direction in the same direction i mean I, or, that is or when a everyone band is, is everyone is willing to just go with whoever the the people in power are whether it's whether it's a, a, a defined power like a this band has a leader or like you said you know it's a band of six people and and two people are the loudest mouths if people are just willing to go with with the the you know the driving force then that is being on the same page even if they're not actually on that page. I'd say, I'd you know say that's I mean? a, that's a flavor of being on the same it page. Is. Yes. Not as good as five guys, seven guys, 10 guys, three guys passionately in yeah. favor of making some music work. Right. Yeah. If, if, you know, you can say, I, I, I will give my decision making up to the other guys because it's more important to them and great. I'm sure you'll do a good job. You'll play, you know, you'll, you'll deliver the goods, but, um, but that feeling when everybody is, is pumped about a set, a song, you know, a section of a show, a medley or whatever, maybe, you know, that, that is when bands do their greatest work. You know, when, when everybody is there, you know, everybody is fully present, not just, not just like agreeable, but like all bought in. That's to me, that's when magic happens. It is. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. sometimes you got to earn your way. Some songs have to earn their way into your set list that, that, you, you know, under that guy's and one guy earn their something way out. or hear something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yep. And that's, you know, where bands work well together is kind of be realistic about those conversations. And this really goes to what you were talking about. Like, do you tape your shows and do you listen as a band together? Do you, do you do a, a band thread? You know, kind of like we, like we did those things with the Macworld band, you know, yeah. like we, we dissected that stuff to death afterwards about what worked, you know, and that was a once a year band about what we were going <laughs> to, yeah, it was a once a year band with like massively crazy people that, that loved to obsess over even the minutest of details. So, but that's but my point is, is that it, is an, it made it every time made it better because yes. we, we would you know actually take these things apart songs that didn't work parts that didn't work and, you know, obsess over them. But you know, for with the, regards for the to, gig next year, <laughs> yeah, for the, yeah, if you, you have twelve months to fix this. Get get on it. Yeah. Um, but I I think that um, and I actually, <laughs> if I think about cover bands, there are bands that just like listen, we're we're a working band. We give people what they want, and I think that the other type, almost every other band is the, you, know, <laughs> you haven't seen my fastball, right? They all have, <laughs> they all have 
I, they all say, you know, we, we pick stuff nobody will try, or they pick stuff that you haven't heard in a long time. I mean, everybody likes that, that journey of trying to find music that's meaningful to you that you want to reinterpret for other people. And, you know, the thought of, you know, we, we have dissected this yeah. playing sweet home Alabama every night, you know, versus go deeper into Skinner's catalog. You know, there's two schools of thought on that. And not only two, again, shades of gray in between, but most, most bands, at least passingly talk about, Oh, wouldn't it be cool to bring this back or to do this yeah. this way or that? And I, I think that's part of the noble pursuit. I, I guarantee you we're going to have bands here who heard this episode and they're like, we could do joy to the world in our set. Like our band would kill that <laughs> tune. Yeah. And I, like I'm thinking about our wedding band, like uptown celebration would like Marty would sing the crap out of that song. And what a great way to start the set. Right. Like, yeah, I like I'm definitely going to steal that idea. And I hope I'm not playing any like I hope I'm not competing with with Gord's band because that's not the point. Of Eric's band. Uh, I th- oh, was it Eric that did Joy to the World yeah. in his set? Sorry about that. Sorry, Eric. Yeah. Um, th- you know, I hope we're not competing together. But uh, but yeah, like that. That's a great tune. And it is one of those things where people are like, wait a minute, like what song is this? So yeah. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Well, and, and also like something like that, that kind of tells people it's going to be a different night tonight. Right. It, we're, you know, we're going to hear what's going on. What just right? happened. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You know, you start the night with Uptown Funk now and people are like, oh, cool. I love that song. But I mean, if you can find those songs that, and there are so many songs. So Joe, Joe always used to say to me when we were struggling with a song, too many rehearsals, still not yep. getting it right. And, you know, Joe would be like, there are so many songs. You go, you go over the Billboard, you know, top 100 for every year, you know, since 1958. There are so many gems and they're not, they're not um, one hit. One, well, they might be one hit wonders, but I mean, they're not obscure. I mean, they were on no. the Billboard charts, right? They, yeah. they, they ha- and people, they're in people's minds. I mean, there are lots of songs to bring back that uh and George the world will be one that was probably number one song right oh yeah yeah that song's not i mean it's obscure in in the realm of let me see your cover, cover band band's set list yeah. right yeah but otherwise it's not an obscure tune at all it, you know and, and and there are lots of songs like that yeah I, really what i want to do is see eric's set list so eric if you want to come along, <laughs> eric okay. if you're out there yeah <laughs> yeah delight I, d- delight us alex uh eric, eric send us your set list boy we've called him gord i mean i know we had a question from gord so we call him gord and eric this is like i got to the gig the other night with uh with bitter pill and was introducing myself to the the, the sound engineer and the night before I, I swear somebody told me that his name was Alex. And, and so um, he said his name to me and I'm like, oh, he didn't say Alex. And I'm like loading my stuff in. He's like on the stage. We both have masks on. I can't see his mouth. Obviously, you know, we're far away from each other. And I'm like, Oh, oh okay. Uh, you know, Eric, I think I said, he's like, what? Well, no, my name's, my name's Jack. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then I come, I, I brought some gear. And when I came back with my second round of gear, another band member had showed up and I'm like, guys, this is Jake. And he's like, well, it's Jack, but you know, you're getting closer. And so I was like, crap, what am I doing with this poor guy? So yeah. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, Eric, but we still want to see your set list. And we're really appreciative of your question because it's a good topic. Like I, I like this. I like knowing we've talked about this a few times, you know, when we had Steve Syacotus on the show a number of years ago, he called them aha songs. Right. And, and to be fair, you know, take on me is probably one of these tunes, although I think it's become more popular for cover bands to play it in, in recent years. But, um, but these are those songs, but I, I like hearing that it's working. Like there, there is at least one band out there and it's Eric's mm-hmm. band, like delivering these somewhat off the beaten path tunes. Like I love Jesus just left Chicago. That's a great little groove. And, uh, and everybody, you know, everybody's heard that song on the radio, even if it's not, mm-hmm. when you think of ZZ Top, you know, it doesn't, you don't like most people don't say, Oh yeah. Th- you know, that's the song. They, they think a sharp dressed man or something, but whatever, you know, that's good. Uh, Paul, I got to play with a new toy recently. Uh, it's the Heil PR 37 microphone. Now, those of you that have listened for a while know that I'm a big fan of Heil's mics. In fact, I'm talking into their PR 40 right now while I do this show. And on stage, I've found that I really like the Heil mics as vocal mics, uh, specifically behind the drums, because the, the one that I, well, I used a PR 30 for years and now have, have sort of upgraded or migrated to the PR 31 BW, which is 
the same mic, just half the distance, half the length, and really, truly built for, you know, a singing drummer. So I've got kind of some room around it with a right angle cable. They've had their their PR35 handheld mic for a while, and I've got a few of those here. I'm not as as much of a fan of the EQ pattern on those. I, I, it doesn't quite have the high-end uh, articulation and presence for my type of voice that the PR30 and 31 do. Well, the PR37 is, seems to be this handheld mic that solves that problem. Uh, it's got uh, an increased off-axis, you know, rear rejection, which is good for a, a you know singing drummer, but also good for lots of other things too. And it really brings in that presence and high end. I, like it's good for the Dave voice was like the first thing I wrote down after starting to test mm. this. It was like, oh, I sound like me through this. Or I sound like the me that I want to sound like through this. It, you know, that, that's the goal, right? That's the goal. And it was designed the me that I want to sound the like. me that I want to sound like. Yeah. And and it, you know, it was designed with they said they worked with a bunch of front of house engineers to get that, uh, you know, tight pattern but not too tight for loud stages, right? Because you want to be able to have something that can can blast through the mix. And any of the Heil mics that I've mentioned here the, in the 30 series are really fantastic at this. Like, it, it yes, they cost more, about double what a SM58 would would run you, but it like it is a world of difference going to a microphone that really can do that high gain thing on a loud stage. It makes a lot of difference. Um, and it, and so they've got a tight pattern, but I've also, I've used the Telefunken M80 series as well, which is sort of the, the, these are both, di they're, they're all dynamic mics, right? They're not condensers and the, the M80s are the same, they're dynamics and, and it, the M80s and the Heil PR35 have kind of been the, the two competing dynamic mics for like pro tours on, on loud stages and the Telefunken sound okay, but they're real like the pattern is so tight on them that I don't like singing. I'm okay if all I'm doing is singing leads, but if I'm singing any harmonies, I feel like I can't blend with the telefunk. Mm. You know, it's like, it, it's not the case, but it, it, the way I have to sing into it, it's like the, the microphone element is at the bottom of the barrel and I've got to sing, like, I got to get on this laser focused, you know, <laughs> path to get my voice down to it. That's not where it is. It's, it's more towards the top, like a normal mic, but it's just a really tight pattern and no real bubble. Whereas these Heil mics and the PR 37 really has this is a bubble around it that I can kind of, you know, sing into and, and blend the harmonies into without it picking up like a snare drum underneath it, which, which I really like. So I'm, I'm stoked about this PR 37. I, I think cool. it's yeah. Was it 269. I think that's right. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's less than 300 bucks. Yeah. 269 is the MSRP and you know how that goes. You can look around and maybe find it a little, a little less expensive at the very nice. little sweet waters and things like that. Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I'm, I was glad to hear they came out with it at uh, NAM this year, I guess, which, it's a show that we should go to in the future when shows happen again, Paul. But uh, you've to. been right. You've been to Nam once or twice. Yeah, it's it. You know, it's it's Disneyland for musicians. I mean, it's a <laughs> wonderful experience. It's a you know, you're just between the cool new things to see, the cool people demonstrating new things, the kind of social aspect of it. Everybody walking around is is either a musician or in the music business some yeah. way. It's really an amazing experience, you know. You have to, you have to kind of have some connection in order to qualify that you're in the industry. Got so it. if you have a good relationship with a, you know, a, a local music store or something like that, that's usually a, the way that people get in. But it's funny. But we should go, and, and I think it would do our listeners a world of service. If you know, again, it's not going to happen in January. They've already no. pulled the plug on that. No. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, maybe you know next summer in Nashville, or certainly in in uh, in LA again in 2022, I guess. But I'd, I'd like to do that. We should get out on the road and you know meet more of our listeners, meet some of our you know sponsors, and you know kind of do some more interviewee type things. Yeah, I would I, I would like that. That would be that would be a good thing. In fact, I I had I had a conversation with a friend in the industry just after Nam this pat this year 2020. And I was like, I'm definitely going to go to NAMM in LA next year. And maybe I'll even, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump it up and I'll do the summer Nashville one. Obviously, you know, the plug's been pulled on all of that and it didn't happen, but you know, hindsight, man. Okay. It's going to be weird. Because like, we're like not going to want to say hindsight is 2020, are we? That's not a thing that we're going to want to no. talk about anymore. No, no, no. no. Got yeah. It. Let's not do list. that. Yeah. But kind of like the movie Macro, another thing that NAMM does is it, it creates a swell of excitement in the industry, like anticipating what, what all the manufacturers are going to come out with 
you know, there, there's a month of buildup where everybody's kind of looking and listening. Yeah. And, and, and then the stuff happens. And then, you know, the stuff that you miss and the hidden gems for another month. I mean, I think that's one of the things that big events are good for. It's just kind of galvanizing, bringing together an industry and, you know, giving people new ideas. Uh, NAM is just one of the coolest things in the world. Yeah. Well, then we will, uh, we will go. I, I, I look forward to experiencing it. Let's do it. Yeah. There's a lot of things I look forward to experiencing, Paul. We talked about a lot of them in this episode. So there you go. Yep. All right. And thanks again, Gordon, Eric, man, those, those were great messages. We love hearing from everybody. There is just really fun. Oh, one thing for both of you guys. Hey, can we make a request that when you send us emails, let us know your band name and let us know where you're from. So we can kind of plug that yeah. and just kind of get an idea about where people are thinking about stuff. We've gotten messages from all corners of the globe, you know, and it's kind of fun to know that we're talking to you know, musicians in Australia, musicians in Europe, musicians in, in Central America, Asia. I mean, we would, we, that's part of the fun of doing this for Dave and I is like, just knowing that there's some musician trying to figure out his perfect set list in, you know, Taipei, you know, that, uh, you know, that wants the rest of the world uh, to kind of know about them. So send us, when you email us, try and put in your band name and, you know, at least your, your city and state. Yeah, that would be great. And email us to feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's where we want to hear from you. So uh, that's where we can hear from you. We, we want to hear from you wherever, and that's the place that we can. So there you go. There you go. All right. Well, that's what I got for this week. You got anything else, Paul? No, fun stuff. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, uh, you know, for everybody for emailing. And we've got some other emails in the queue, too, so they're coming. Huh. Always be performing. Always, no matter what. No matter what. That's a great tune, isn't it? No matter what. <laughs> <laughs>